Hi, this is K2 from Behringer, a clone of Korg's MS-20, an analog dual oscillator, dual filter, semi-modular synth. In this video, I'll take a look at K2, explain its patch bay, and also explore a whole bunch of patch ideas and tricks, which are relevant for the MS-20 as well. I'll also look at what makes it different for better and worse compared to other similar synths in Behringer's lineup, or any other synth for that matter. Let's start with an overview. Like I mentioned, K2 is a recreation of Korg's original MS-20 from 1978 in a desktop version that can also be taken out of its case and mounted as a Eurorack module. The build seems excellent and solid, it doesn't feel too cramped, but the knobs are a little harder to turn compared to other synths, including Behringer's. It's worth noting that Korg also issued its own recreations of the MS-20. The most relevant comparable to this is Korg's MS-20 Mini, which is bigger, can't be mounted as a Eurorack module, but has a built-in keyboard and mod wheel. As of the making of this video, the two aren't priced that far apart, especially considering the built-in keyboard in the MS-20. It sells for $460, the K2 sells for around $390. K2, on the other hand, has the advantage of having two filter models, one modeled after the newer MS-20s, and one modeled after the older ones, which scream even more. I won't be comparing K2's sound to the old or new MS-20s in this video because that's been done quite a lot. If I had to sum up those other videos, the two don't sound exactly the same, but the K2 is quite close. Sound aside, the K2 and the MS-20 are almost identical in terms of all the design quirks, like the patch bay layout and features, hertz per volt pitch control, S-trigs instead of V-trigs, and the odd way the envelopes modulate, more on that later. So this tutorial and the patch ideas section mostly apply to both. So what's the big deal about the K2 or MS-20? What makes them worth putting up with all the voltage quirks I just mentioned? That reason is the filters, more specifically the screaming character of their resonance, and the fact that there's two of them, a low pass filter and a high pass filter that gets fed into it. Both of them equally capable of screaming. Now, some synths have a single filter and occasionally it will have more than one mode, high pass, low pass, or band pass. Typically, it'll only do one of them at a time. K2 has both filters active simultaneously. Like I mentioned, K2 has two filter models. Filter one is based on the earlier MS-20s. And definitely shrieks more. This filter, by the way, doesn't lose bass as you increase resonance. So this is a sweep without resonance. Notice as I increase resonance, we don't lose any bass. This filter starts yelling pretty quickly, and yeah, if I uh, put resonance all the way up, it'll do that. That's filter model one, by the way. This is filter model two. Slightly less crazy. And the high pass filter sounds like this. Without resonance, with resonance. This is filter two. And filter model one. Blah, blah, blah. 
before we talk about the patch tips, let's review the layout. And I have to say, I'm not a fan of this staircase layout, nor the busy and odd layout of the patch bay compared to more modern synths. I mean, it does make sense. All the modulation sources live on the bottom below the staircase and all the modulation destinations, the oscillators and filters live on top. Just ignore the staircase, treat the first three columns as the oscillator section, including its modulation, the second two columns, the filter section with their modulation, and then the modulation sources are these three columns. Similarly for the patch bay, I think it's mentally easier just to block out all the squiggles and look at the label on top of every jack. That's its main function and whether it's an input or an output. After you've gotten used to that, you can look at the layout around the jacks for a reminder of how everything is connected. Before we explore the patch bay, let's take a brief look at the left side of the synth. Starting with the oscillators, you've got two of them. Each of them has four basic options. Oscillator one is either a triangle waveform, sawtooth, variable pulse, where you can change the pulse width manually with this knob. There's no pulse width modulation unless you do it manually. And a noise generator. If you do want noise in your sound, by the way, there's no need to waste oscillator one and its detuning opportunities. There's a noise generator in the patch bay and I'll show you later on how to quite easily patch it into the mix. Then there's oscillator two with its own level control in the mixer. It's got a sawtooth. And then square and narrow pulse. And then it also has a ring mod option, which is impacted not by this switch, but rather by the pulse width knob on oscillator one. Now ring mod changes drastically based on the relative tuning between the two oscillators. Right now they're tuned to each other, so works pretty nicely and is tamed. But if we vary this just slightly, it'll start going crazy. Playing much less nice, which is that's what you want, that's great. If you want it to play nice, either tune the oscillators in intervals of octaves. Or fifths from one another. But there are interesting tones in between those intervals as well, of course. A general tip about the K2, at some point as you transpose your keyboard higher or just play higher, it'll start responding to notes. If you want to go higher than what the keyboard input allows, just use the scale knobs. The oscillators scale an octave apart from one another. I mentioned before that K2 and the MS-20 don't have pulse width modulation, unless you do it manually, but of course if you Activate both oscillators and detune them slightly from each other. You can get a similar effect. Okay, let's talk about the onboard modulation. Both the K2 and the MS-20 have a single LFO or modulation generator as it's called here and two envelope generators, a simpler envelope generator one and a more complex envelope generator two. By default, the LFO or modulation generator is patched into all three knobs here, which control the two filters and both oscillators. So as you change its shape or frequency, you won't hear it until you increase the mod depth for any one of these three. So let's say if I wanted to modulate pitch for a slight vibrato, I would add mod depth to taste and obviously frequency. The LFO doesn't go quite into audio rates for nice FM, but I'll show you other ways to get nice FM results with a hidden oscillator in here. The default routing of the LFO is the triangle to saw to ramp shape. So let's try that for example on the low pass filter. So the top knob is the mod depth for the LFO. 
and shapes go all the way from saw or downward ramp to triangle to ramp. You'll notice the LFO also has a square shape here on top. You can't access that just through the panel. You need to do some patching in the patch bay. It's quite easy. You patch the square output into the total input. We'll get to that in a bit. So that's the LFO. Let's talk about the envelopes here too. K2 and MS20 do things a little bit differently. Now, as long as you're controlling level, K2 and the MS20 work like other synths. So the ADSR, determined in envelope generator two, is patched into the VCA to control the amplitude of our sound. So attack is the time it'll take the note to reach maximum level. Decay is the time it'll take it to reach the sustain level. And then release is the time it'll take it to die down when you leave a note. EG2 also has a hold parameter which will sustain the note for as long as you want using this knob. So even if you tap it lightly, it'll hold for as long as you want. Envelope generator two, by the way, is patched into both filters by default and you determine its mod depth using these knobs. Envelope generator one is patched into the pitch of both oscillators. Again, you determine its depth by turning this knob. So what do I mean when I say that EG1 and EG2 behave differently than other synths in terms of modulators? Well, most envelopes will typically start at zero level, ramp up to their maximum level in the attack stage, then decay down to the sustain level, and then die down at the release stage. K2 and MS20 envelopes work differently. So let's see what this means in practical terms. Let's take, for example, envelope generator one. It is an attack sustain release envelope with a potential delay time before the attack stage, but let's ignore the delay time for now. So envelope generator one by default is routed into the pitch of the oscillators. Let's listen to what that sounds like. I'll increase mod depth. Now nothing happens until I start changing the attack or the release times. Sustain level of the pitch mod is the level of the, of the note, so there's no pitch modulation. But as I increase attack, its beginning starts getting pushed down. Now that's actually a good thing because increasing attack will make a pitch bend that always leads into the original note regardless of the attack time. This is the original note. I increase attack. It leads into the same note. Same goes for release. It's a pitch bend down for the moment that I leave a note. So as I increase the mod depth of envelope generator one, I'll get a deeper pitch down for the release time which can be either long or short. Which is pretty cool. So no other synth works this way, but if you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. If you want to get a similar effect with other synths, say to have a pitch up into a note, then you need to ignore the attack stage of the envelope, and there's typically a decay stage that takes care of that. Envelope generator two works the same way with respect to the filters. If you're curious what this looks like in terms of voltage levels, let's take a quick peek. This is the reverse output of envelope generator one, so I'm inverting it on the scope. Notice as I change the sustain level, voltage changes as well, which isn't natural if you're familiar with the way that other synths work. And if we take a look at say, attack, decay, and sustain and release, uh, an envelope like this, as we change the sustain, the whole envelope moves up and down. So we're definitely not in synth Kansas anymore as far as envelopes are concerned in K2 and the MS-20. If this is your first synth, it'll be quite natural. If you're coming from other synths, just be aware that as a mod source, envelopes behave differently than what you'd expect. Okay, let's move on to the patch bay. Here too, the K2 and MS-20 kind of live in their own little parallel universe. Most modern synths use the volt per octave standard to control the pitch of the oscillator and filter. 
where each additional volt sent through a cable represents an instruction to play one octave higher. Oscillators that respond this way have an exponential response because they need to keep doubling the frequency of the oscillator for every additional volt received. In the hertz per volt convention, you need to keep doubling the voltage every time you want to tell the synth to play an octave higher. Oscillators or filters that respond this way have a linear response to voltage. Now, if you're controlling K2 with MIDI, it doesn't matter. But if you're sending control voltage to any of the oscillators, either through VCO 1 plus 2 input or the VCO 2 input, you need to make sure that you're sending hertz per volt signals into here. Otherwise, K2 won't play in tune. So the key step, for example, here is configurable. You could tell it to send volt per octave or hertz per volt signals. If you have control voltage that doesn't support the hertz per octave standard, you need to get some sort of converter. Disting has that built in. It has a linear to exponential and exponential to linear converter inside it. And there are a few standalone modules that do that as well. Now, I know I'm going to get asked about this case. So if you're wondering, it's a DIY project from a company called Uncertain Proportions. It's a great starter case for a small number of companion modules to this synth because it comes with built-in power. Anyway, to continue this riveting discussion about standards, K2 and MS20 also support a less common S-trigger standard for gates and triggers as opposed to the V-trig standard. Most synths normally send out zero voltage to indicate a low gate or non-trigger and a higher voltage, say 2, 5, or 10 volts, to tell a destination to trigger something. K2 and MS20 use S-trigs to trigger events, which are more or less the opposite. It normally holds a certain voltage level and then shorts it to zero to signify a trigger. So if you do want to trigger events here, make sure that your controller can send out S-trigs. Key step can. You can configure its gate out to be either S-trig or V-trig. If your controller or sequencer can't send out S-trigs, you'll need some sort of module or circuit to convert between the two. The circuit that does that is actually pretty simple. Okay, so armed with the knowledge of Hertz per volt and S-trigs, we're ready to tackle the patch bay. Like I mentioned before, an easy way to figure out what each jack does is to look at the label on top of it. So for example, if I wanted to trigger envelope generator one, yes, its trigger is somewhere in the vicinity of where it says envelope generator one, but it's not control input, it's EG1 trigger in. Let's start by looking at the top row. These three frequency inputs lead into the frequency of the oscillators and the frequency of both filters and they're controlled or attenuated or moderated by these three knobs here. So for example, if you didn't like the fact that envelope generator one controls both the VCA and the filters, you could replace the filter modulator with envelope generator one by plugging its out into either one or both of the inputs. You can plug a single source into multiple destinations with a stack cable and you just patch one source into two destinations and you've now replaced envelope generator two with envelope ge generator one to control the filters. Just like you can replace EG1 and EG2 with these jacks, the total jack replaces the LFO in controlling all three destinations here. So notice it says here MG text, that's total, external, this input here will replace the LFO and you determine the mod depth for whatever you plug into here using these three knobs. You can also route external audio into the mix using the external signal input. So let's take a look at some of the other modules on the patch bay. The ESP or external signal processor, this is actually a bunch of different useful modules, but its main intended function is to convert incoming monophonic audio, say your voice or a guitar, which I happen to have here, to hertz per volt control voltage, which can then be routed to control oscillator frequency. So to make this work, I need to patch CV out to control my oscillators, CV in. And then this module will generate a trigger based on incoming audio and threshold level. And we'll use that to trigger the synth, the envelopes. And I've got a cable coming out of my trusty guitar here. I'll plug that into the signal input. For the sake of the demo, I will remove the key step from here. And so that we can all see what's going on, let's just place our little friend here. So signals coming in through here as I increase amplification. Oh. Okay, this threshold level here for the trigger as well. So it's tracking, I can adjust CV here. Let's just play it one note at a time. Oh. 
So you can get it to work. It's not precise, but you could look at this imprecision as a cool effect. By the way, another cool little feature here is the envelope follower. So I can take the envelope out and plug that, say, to control the low pass filter. And what this will give us is a kind of wah. So this is without the effect. Let's open it up. And this is an MS-20 style filter, so why not crank it up a bit? Right, the envelope follower will follow the level of the sound, and as it dies down, we'll close the filter. The ESP circuit also includes an adjustable band pass filter. You set the lower and upper edges using the low cut and high cut knobs. Note that these work the opposite of low pass and high pass filters. Low cut cuts out the low frequencies and high cut cuts out the high ones. The next little interesting module bundled in the patch bay is the sample and hold module. Now I know it says sample and hold here, but it's not. It's actually a track and hold module, both here and in the MS-20. Track and hold lets control voltage or audio through and will freeze or hold it in place for as long as it gets an S-trig gate into this input. So for example, let's take the LFO or mod generator, plug it into the input of the track and hold or sample and hold circuit, then take the output and use that to control the pitch of the oscillator. So we'll hear this clearly. And to hear modulation coming in through here, remember I need to not attenuate it, which means turn this knob clockwise. Okay, so that's the LFO, moving the pitch of the oscillators up and down. Now to freeze the track and hold, I need to send it a trigger. There is an easy trigger output right here using this switch. So let's do that. Let's take trigger switch out, plug it into the clock. And now I can freeze this anytime I want by pressing this button. It'll freeze it at whatever level the LFO was at when I pressed this button. We'll get back to this later in the patch ideas section. The next independent unit in the patch bay is the second VCA. This second VCA is normaled to being triggered by the envelope generator. It's a DC coupled VCA, meaning that you can use it to control the level of both audio or slow moving control voltage. Okay, so what can we do with this patch bay? Let's go through a few ideas. First, I promised you that we don't need to waste Oscillator one for noise. There is a noise generator here in the patch bay, both a pink noise and white noise generator. The problem is if we just take say white noise and plug it to the external signal in, it'll come in pretty hot and loud. We don't have level control. Luckily there's a knob controlled VCA in the ESP. If we take its output and plug it into the external signal in, we have level control over the noise. And we can also shape the noise with a bandpass filter if we like, if we plug it into this output. So filter either the high or low. And we could plug in pink noise, which is a bassier noise through here. And filter that as well. Cut the lows if we want to get a lighter rumble. Now, if we're busy playing our guitar through the ESP, we could always plug the noise in, let's take white noise, into the VCA, and send that back into the output. Now remember, by default, EG1 controls the level of the VCA. So we've got attack, and release control. But we could use any CV source for that. For example, take the mod wheel output of the key step, plug that to control the VCA through here. And now I've got key step controlling the level of the noise using its mod wheel. And I could attenuate any other signal this way as well. So this is also a great way to moderate or attenuate control voltage, which moves us to our next little tip or trick, which is using the sample and hold or track and hold circuit to generate a random LFO. A random value LFO is basically a sample and hold circuit that takes noise, either white or pink. I'll show you why pink is a little bit better suited for that in a bit. And 
freezes it, freezes the random noise levels coming out of the noise generator, and then sends that to a mod destination, in our case, the cutoff of the filter. Let's just clear this out for a second. So I take the output of the sample and hold module, send it to the cutoff frequency of our low pass filter. And just for a second, I'll use the trig switch out to freeze our signal rather than the LFO, just so we hear what this sounds like. So I set the mod depth, set the filter frequency, let's add some resonance. So because of the way track and hold works, we get noise modulating the filter unless we freeze the noise at a certain level. Let's just make this more extreme so we can hear it. Problem is I can't press this fast enough. Let's try and get our LFO to do it. I'll use the square output or pulse output of the LFO to trigger the sample and hold module. Now, if this was normal sample and hold, you wouldn't be hearing the noise in between. The way to minimize this problem is to make the pulse as narrow as possible. And if we use pink noise instead of white noise, we'll hear this even less. And that's how we get a nice cool little random LFO. I can choose this to moderate the modulation, moderate the depth of the random LFO. And like I mentioned, if I wanted to, I could pass this control voltage through the VCA, patch the output of the sample and hold into the VCA, and then bring our trusty old mod wheel to moderate the depth of the randomness as well. Okay, let's clear this up and look at some other tricks. I mentioned before that you need a hertz per volt signal to control the pitch of the K2, but there's a way around that. So if I unplug MIDI for the sake of this example and plug the pitch coming out of key step to the CV control of both VCO1 and 2 and take its trigger and plug that into here, it will play and track properly because I set this to Hertz per volt and S trig. But what if I go to my key step settings and mess around with them and change it back to volts per octave? So now key step is sending out a volt per octave and it's not a pretty sight anymore. Now you could use, like I mentioned before, a third party module like Disting to make the conversion from volt per octave to Hertz per volt for you. But unlike the VCO2 and VCO1 and 2 inputs on the panel, the voltage controlled oscillator input here, the frequency control and the cutoff control for the filters doesn't work on Hertz per volt, but rather will respond to volt per octave signals if we set the mod depth properly. Now, the reason this is important is because if you want the filters to track what you play on a keyboard, they actually won't track Hertz per volt properly. Anyway, let's take pitch out of the VCO1 plus two input and plug it into the frequency input here. So the trick is just to play with the mod depth until you get a range that sounds like an octave. And now we have volt per octave controlling the pitch of the oscillators and you can control the filter this way as well and have the filter track properly. This leads into another nice little trick that you can use the high pass filter to increase bass if you crank up its resonance. So now if I bring back my oscillator, I can use the high pass filter for a bass boost on the oscillator. This is without the bass boost, and this is with. Okay, on to the next little trick. If you want to generate a drone and play around with that without having to hold a key, just take one of the outputs here. Let's see the envelope out, plug that into the trigger in, and you get a drone that you can adjust without holding a key. Now there are quite a few more nuggets in the ESP circuit. For example, if we take the signal out and plug it into the ESP in, like this, and then pass either a filtered or non-filtered version of the audio back into the external signal input, we could get really nice distortion effects by increasing the gain on this VCA. This is without any resonance. You can imagine the craziness there. actually nicer on filter 2. So 
Filter 2, the tamer one, the well-behaved one compared to Filter 1. Gets pretty crazy when you do this. Even crazier than Filter 1. So if you want more screechiness, try Filter 2 with feedback. Don't forget you have a filter on the feedback itself, so if it's too crazy you can tone it down with these as well. So I know in some of the comparisons to the original MS-20, filter one doesn't sound quite as screechy. Try filter two with feedback. Now there's a, another really neat and useful feedback trick and that's turning the ESP into an independent oscillator. And we can do a number of things with that. So to get that going, we need to plug the output of the bandpass back into the input. And then so we could hear it, we need to plug that into the external signal input. And I'll turn down the filter resonance and oscillators, so we've got nothing here. But as I increase the signal level, we'll start to hear a tone. Initially a sine wave, but it very quickly crops and distorts into a square wave. And we can tune this oscillator using the low cut and high cut knobs. So I can tune it down by turning this down. It goes quite low. And I can even tune it lower by increasing signal level, though it does distort even more. I can bring it up by bringing up the low cut to quite high as well. So there are a number of things we can do with this. First, just use it as a, another drone oscillator. So I'll bring in oscillator one. I could tune this to whatever I wanted. Now, if this becomes too overbearing, don't forget you can always pass it through the VCA and tone it down a bit. Another use for this is for rapid FM. So let's plug this into the frequency of oscillator one and two. So this is a nice way to get FM style sounds. You can play with the frequency to get the effect you want. This works on the filter as well. Nice madness to be had here. So what else can we do with a fast oscillator? Well, we have a sample and hold circuit. You can get a pretty nice bit crushing or downsampling effect with a fast oscillator sampling and holding an audio signal. So to do this, I need to pass my signal out either through here or through the phones into the sample and hold circuit. And I'll pass that through this output because I need to use a different output. The main output won't work well for this. Let's plug that into here. Now this works okay with regular waveforms. Notice the staircase downsampling pattern change on the scope. But if we bring up resonance, we get these nice formant-like peaks. reverb doesn't hurt either. So what we have here is basically an analog bit crusher or downsampler. Okay, let's clear this up and take a look at something else. One of my favorite things to do with a synth that has more than one oscillator is play them paraphonically or duophonically. Now there's a simple way which doesn't require a key step and a way cooler one which does. Let's start with a simple one, which happens to be another nice use for the sample and hold circuit. So if I take the keyboard CV out and plug that into the sample and hold, and then take the sample and hold output and use that to control only oscillator two, only VCO two and not VCO one and two. Well, remember this is track and hold, right? So voltage just goes through. I am now controlling both oscillators with the keyboard but I can use a trigger. Let's start with the trigger switch to freeze the voltage going out to oscillator two. So let's do that. Plug that into here and that into the clock of the sample and hold circuit. Now I can hold one of the oscillators by pressing this and then move with the second one. 
So I could say, hold the bass note, then hold this note, then hold this. So that's nice, but kind of inconvenient. An alternate way would be to use the keyboard trigger to freeze a note. So the first note that I play will hold both oscillators and then subsequent notes We'll play the second oscillator until I leave both notes, then I could fix another note as, our, as my drone note. And then do that again. Playing paraphonically, by the way, means that you're playing two different notes, but both notes will share the same filter and VCA envelope. So if I bring up the attack time, They'll both come in gradually, bring up release time. They'll die down, though when I leave one note before the other, it'll sound kind of odd. So that's a nice way to play paraphonically, but it's a little bit clunky because it requires you to play legato. Like I mentioned, if you have a key step, which you kind of should if you're into modular synths, here's a better way. I won't be needing any of this sample and hold business. Really, all that needs to be done is to take the pitch out of key step, set to hertz per volt, of course, and plug that into the input of VCO2, right? Only VCO2, not VCO1 and 2. Now you will need to tune the oscillators relative to each other. But once you do, you can play one note with one finger, another note with another one. Both oscillators will play a single note. The minute you add a note on top, It'll steal one of the oscillators, and then just play as you want. Now the reason this works is because we set key step note priority on the CV gate settings to high, so it'll send the highest note out through its CV out. And I used Behringer's synth tool to give it low note priority, so it'll pick up the low note coming in through MIDI. And yeah, that's all it takes for this to work. You can transpose the oscillators relative to each other. And it just works. This gets slightly cooler, by the way, if you add some portamento, because only one of the oscillators will be impacted by this. So. It starts to get a little bit polyphonic in the sense that you've got portamento on the lower oscillator. and no portamento here. Now this is paraphonic, but another way to get sort of polyphonic with this and apply different envelopes to each of the notes is to use the two filters. So you could use the low pass filter to impact the higher note and the high pass filter to impact or modulate the lower note. So let me explain what I mean. I'll play two notes here, then shut the filter down here and then use the LFO to modulate it. So now, the high note sort of gets its own little repeating pattern using the low pass filter, but the bass note isn't impacted at all. Now obviously if I bring the filter down low enough, it'll impact both. But I could use the filter to selectively impact just the higher note. So that's the tips section before we wrap up to pros and cons. Let's take a quick look at Behringer's synth tool. It's quite simple. You've got control over a small number of parameters. You can polychain K2s, though to play them polyphonically, you'll need an additional K2 for each voice, as well as to match the knob settings across all of them. So that might take a bit of work. I think one setting that doesn't exist here, and I don't know if it can be added or not, is the ability to multi-trigger while you're playing legato. So currently as you play legato, the envelopes won't re-trigger, which is a nice default, but it would be nice to have an option to have them re-trigger. Okay, so let's take a look at K2's pros and cons. In terms of cons, and this is true for many analog synths, but not all of them, you can't save presets on the K2. To make the most of it, you'll need to understand what's going on, otherwise there's no point. 
On the Sonic side, there are some differences between its filters and the original MS-20s. Whether that's important or not, I'll leave to you. I showed you a way to make them a little bit more aggressive with filter two and feedback earlier in the patch ideas section. If you look at other alternatives, like I mentioned earlier, Korg's own MS-20 Mini is currently only slightly more expensive and has a built-in keyboard, though it's not Eurorack mountable. Other alternatives are Behringer's own desktop synths. You'll find more modern features there, including a multi-trigger option, oscillator sync, real pulse width modulation, volt per octave support, built-in oscillator FM, and potentially other more advanced synth and configuration features. On the pros side, which you won't find in almost any other synth except the original MS-20 and its reissues, is the screaming nature of the filter, two of them that you can use in parallel, and the host of goodies in the patch bay, including the ESP pitch detection, which can't be found anywhere else to my knowledge in analog form. So overall, this is a pretty nice homage to a quite quirky synth. And if you like the tips and tricks and patch ideas in this video, there's plenty more where that came from in my ever expanding book available to people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, ring the bell if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Feel free to ask me anything in the comments section below. Thanks for watching.